Hey bro, welcome back to 12 Days in March. This series of videos on heart failure will continue with the discussion of the cardiomyopathies. In this presentation, we'll knock off dilated cardiomyopathy before concluding the series with a presentation on restrictive cardiomyopathy and diastolic heart failure. As a total random reminder, a PDF of this and all presentations is available at the website. Before launching, I want to offer a clarifying word on what is engendered by the term cardiomyopathy. That is, when I first got into this racket, it wasn't clear to me why dilated cardiomyopathies didn't include the ischemic cardiomyopathy of a big anterior wall MI. Likewise, what the hell was the difference between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and hypertensive heart disease? But as you will see in this presentation, whereas the cardiomyopathies have overlapping pathophysiologic features on step one, both dilated and hypertrophic refer to very specific disorders that generally occur on a genetic basis. So here is the definition of a cardiomyopathy. A cardiomyopathy is a myocardial disorder in which the heart muscle is structurally and functionally abnormal in the absence of coronary disease, hypertension, blah, blah, blah. The definition goes on to describe a distinct set of conditions that often have a genetic component and, as mentioned, do share hemodynamic and pathophysiologic parameters. From the genetic point of view, dilated cardiomyopathy may occur on a genetic basis, whereas hypertrophic cardiomyopathy always occurs on a genetic basis, and restrictive, not so much. And to conclude this background, I include disorders classified as dilated cardiomyopathy that are not genetically acquired, with Chagas being a pretty classic example. So this introduction was just to set the stage for our discussion of the cardiomyopathies. Examples such as LVH and valvular heart disease share pathophysiologic features, but aren't classified as cardiomyopathies. I describe them as being guilty with an explanation. Sorry for that delay, but it made me nuts when I started with this topic. So here are the cardiomyopathies, dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive. Dilated is pretty clear a big dilated left ventricle. In terms of nomenclature, the great minds in medicine did us a huge favor when they coined the terms heart failure with reduced EF, got that reduced in dilated cardiomyopathy, compared to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as seen in the restrictive heart disorders. Moving on, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy describes the distinct entity associated with obstructive physiology. And restrictive describes a thick, non-compliant ventricle that suffers from an inability to graciously accept blood at normal pressures. In the lower drawing, I've included a histopathology graphic of amyloid, which is the prototypic restrictive condition on step one. Just planning ahead on that one. And here's the good news. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has already been covered elsewhere, specifically during the sound module. Like all presentations, that one sucks, but it is presented with the valve disorders due to the physical exam findings and the obstructive physiology that overlaps with aortic stenosis. It will shorten this presentation, but you are stuck listening to a separate presentation. Wah, wah. All right, so these are the topics we'll discuss in the third and fourth presentations in the heart failure series. Please note, and this is a big note, the restrictive cardiomyopathies have overlapping pathophysiologic features with diastolic heart failure, so the two will be presented together. So to finally launch dilated cardiomyopathy, you can see a partial list of the causes. The familial or genetic etiologies suffer from a variety of mutations, but I'll mention a couple that you should be aware of. You will note the category of acquired or secondary causes of dilated cardiomyopathy, including chemotherapeutic agents, thiamine, and infections. Again, from the classification point of view, ischemic and valvular disorders are specifically excluded, but we'll cover the important overlapping pathophysiologic features in this presentation. P.S. I didn't invent these classifications. So this is how they play the dilated cardiomyopathy game. The vignettes describe a symptomatic patient, generally using the language of S3 and Rawls. Remember, S3 describes a chamber at its elastic limit. The question stem then takes you to the pressure volume loops or curves, which we'll review shortly. From there, they expect you to make the specific diagnosis, such as doxorubicin toxicity, or identify the etiologic agent, such as the parasite in Chagas disease or the vector. Ah, the reduviate bug. Hope I didn't scare you. Alternatively, they can describe a patient with CHF and recent viral infection and ask you to identify the correct pressure volume graphics and or hemodynamic parameters. So let's move on to those graphics and hemodynamic parameters. These are the players you need to be familiar with, but you need to understand them in board speak. So what language will they use to describe that cavernous cavity? How will they describe the surrogates for contractility? And what is the counter-regulatory response to a heart that isn't pumping so great? These are the players. You should be pretty familiar with these by now, including end diastolic volume as the principal surrogate for the dilated LV cavity. 
Impaired contractility will be represented by stroke volume, EF, or cardiac output. The counter-regulatory response will include the full range of derivatives related to the neurohumoral response, as discussed in our previous video. Without being too redundant, recall that the sympathetic nervous system response includes both an increase in total peripheral resistance as well as in venous return. These both become targets of inquiry, especially in questions on cardiogenic shock. Continuing, the hemodynamic derivatives can and will be expressed by the pressure volume loop as depicted. This graphic should be ingrained in the very fiber of your existence by now. Make sure you can readily label the end diastolic volume, stroke volume, and end systolic volume on this curve. Be prepared to see this graphic and translate it into the myriad causes of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Remember, we're focused on dilated cardiomyopathy, but for all intents and purposes, this graphic refers to any and all causes of heart failure with reduced EF. It doesn't discriminate. So here are your labels. You should be able to affix them to this graphic with your eyes closed. Go ahead and try. Whoops, I tried it with my eyes closed and missed. All right, let's move on to the pressure volume curve. This curve seems to give students fits. You can see I've labeled it the compliance curve and it defines the relationship between volume and pressure. I think it is easiest if you consider compliance as being synonymous with distensibility. That is, is it easy or difficult to inflate a vessel such as the two shown? Is it highly compliant or poorly distensible? Is it a deflated balloon or a rubber bottle? Beating the concept to death, if I had to infuse these five pints of blood into one of these vessels, which will accept the blood more readily? That is, which is more distensible or compliant? In which vessel do I have to overcome less resistance? Correct. The dilated left ventricle can more readily accept this high volume of blood under lower pressures. On the right, we see a thick, non-compliant ventricle that will only accept the same volume of blood if infused under greater pressures. Make sure you understand this concept. It isn't going away. Returning to our curves, the patient with the dilated left ventricle will have a highly compliant chamber accepting that high volume of blood at lower pressures even compared to the normal heart. It is highly distensible. This is a key distinction from the restrictive cardiomyopathies and is a major test derivative. So the classic test question will include the patient with signs and symptoms of heart failure, including an S3. You will be expected to choose the correct curve correlating with a compliant left ventricle. And there it is. We will be grappling again with this concept when we discuss restrictive cardiomyopathy. All right, let's move on to the pathology derivatives. In dilated cardiomyopathy, pathology is pretty light. We'll look at the mutations, but unlike hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where 100% of the cases are on a genetic basis, this is not the case with dilated cardiomyopathy. Briefly, because I think they are low yield, one of the two key mutations involves the dystrophin gene. This is the same dystrophin gene from the muscular dystrophies. Recall, dystrophin performs a scaffolding function in muscle cells. The other mutation which might be specifically mentioned involves titan, one of my favorites because it's the largest protein in the body. I love that. For some reason, it reminds me of Thor, the greatest superhero of all time. And now, as you can see, Titan is an intermediate fiber that stabilizes the heavy chain and is also a great action hero. The take-home on these two mutations simply highlight the genetic description of the cardiomyopathies as distinct and separate entities from disorders such as ischemic cardiomyopathy. Continuing with our discussion of pathology and the familial dilated cardiomyopathies, we see the histopathology is described as non-specific, i.e., it isn't test worthy. One less thing for you to study. What is nonspecific? As this, the fibers show hypertrophy and or atrophy. There is variable amounts of fibrosis and the morphologic appearance does not correlate with cardiac function. That, my friends, is pretty nonspecific. No juicy test derivatives. As for the acquired dilated cardiomyopathies, however, you should be familiar with these three players. Prussian blue stain for iron overload in hemochromatosis. Do be aware that hemochromatosis can present with both restrictive or dilated cardiomyopathy. It is also fair game for them to give you a patient with a viral prodrome and heart failure symptoms while asking you to identify the pathology of a lymphocytic infiltrate. More likely than not, as you'll see shortly, this will be a setup for complications of dilated cardiomyopathy. And finally, recall that acute rheumatic fever presents with valvulitis or dilated cardiomyopathy. Don't forget that fact. I've already mentioned it a hundred times. The hallmark pathologic finding will be Ashoff bodies as reviewed in our rheumatic fever video. So as the pathology of familial dilated cardiomyopathy is nonspecific, the same cannot be said for these specific acquired disorders. 
And finally, for the dilated cardiomyopathy, the one complication to be aware of is mural thrombus. It isn't specific to dilated cardiomyopathy. It can be seen in any of the conditions that mess up the LV. And here's how they play the mural thrombus game. They describe a classic patient and or present a pressure volume graphic consistent with dilated cardiomyopathy. Next thing you know, the patient strokes out. What was the cause? Answer, mural thrombus. We reviewed this scenario in our discussion of ischemic heart disease as well. Keep mural thrombus on your short list of stroke plus cardiac disease. In fact, here is that short list. Dilated left ventricle, atrial fibrillation, and PFO. I'm sure there are others, but then it wouldn't be a short list. Look what I just did. I made it a longer list. That's stupid, but I didn't want you to complain that I forgot vegetations and myxoma. Maybe next time you won't complain. And here is dilated cardiomyopathy in a nutshell. Remember, we are talking about heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Most derivatives are straightforward and simply reflect the failing heart. You should be familiar with the pathophysiologic derivatives, namely the graphics that we've reviewed. We already mentioned that pathology and genetic derivatives aren't major targets, and the only complication to be familiar with, besides heart failure, is mural thrombus. So I'll conclude this recording here so you can stretch your legs and fire up another cup of coffee. When and if you return, we'll pick up the discussion of restrictive cardiomyopathy before concluding with the ever-popular compare and contrast materials. If you have any questions about any of this junk, drop me a line at 12 days. Talk to you soon.